et démocratie, mia pire et ai. Eleutheros ta prosto koinon, politu omen. Lego kein heita holi, teis helados, hai juicing eina. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the most important ceremony performed in Athens, namely the ceremony each year honoring those who laid down their lives for their country. It was accompanied by a funeral speech known as the Epitaphios Logos. This was the ancestral custom, so-called. Like lots of Athenian customs, it was thought to have been established by Solon, though modern scholars believe that it was established as late as around 460 in the form in which it has come down to us. This too was the period when the state began to inscribe on stone what we call casualty lists. That's to say inscriptions recording the names of those who died in the war each year according to their tribal affiliation. For the most part, only the names along with the patronymic and the demotic are recorded, but in a few cases there is a poetic tribute as well. They're rather like the memorials to the dead that you find in English villages, listing the names of those who fell in World War I, World War II, and so on. The nearest equivalent in this country is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., which lists in chronological order, from year to year, the names of the 58,318 military personnel who perished in the Vietnam War. And as with the Athenian casualty lists, there is no reference to rank. It was probably in the 460s that the state assumed the function of conducting funeral rites for the war dead in the Keramica Cemetery and began commemorating them in a very public way, appropriating this role from the family, M much in the same way that those who die in war serving our country are honoured with a state funeral and burial in Arlington National Cemetery and in other national cemeteries. The allegiance of the war dead to the Athenian state and to their tribe, in other words, now trumps their attachment to family. The war dead become the property of the state because the state wants to show that it honours those who have sacrificed their lives. And like us too, the Athenians, and, and indeed all Greeks, treated the recovery of their war dead as the highest priority. Uniquely, however, the 192 dead who died at Marathon in 490 fighting the Persians were interred where they fell. And this was because their valour in defeating a much larger army was deemed to have been extraordinary. And so the Athenians accorded them collective heroic status, uh, meaning that they occupied a status somewhere between the human and the divine. There was another democratic consequence resulting from the public interment of the war dead. It prevented aristocrats from using the occasion to showcase their prestige and wealth. We've already seen how Solon in the early 6th century limited the scope and scale of private funerals. And now, too, by appropriating the war dead for its own purposes, the Athenian state further reduced the opportunity for aristocrats to exploit a funeral for their own propagandist purposes. It's also noticeable that in the period from 500 to 430 BC, there are no life-size marble statues commemorating the dead. The only logical explanation for this is that there was a ban on funerary sculpture during this period, uh, presumably for the same reason, to prevent aristocrats from erecting such sculptures to show off their wealth. It wasn't until 430, in fact, that the ban was lifted, and probably that was in part because there was a lot of out-of-work masons who had been involved with the Periclean building project who now needed employment. So, it's now the fall of 431, and we're going to commemorate 
the sacrifice of those Athenians who perished in the first year of the Peloponnesian War. Greek states were constantly at war, mostly engaged in pointless squabbles with their neighbours, either for parcels of land on their borders or because of some grievance whose origin might be centuries old. They generally confined their fighting to the spring and summer, which is why this ceremony takes place in the fall. There was nothing particularly distinctive about the ceremony this year, except that the number of dead was unusually high. And that's because Athens and her allies are engaged in a fight to the death with the Spartans and their allies. So today there is a heightened sense of grief among the community. Everyone has suffered a loss or, or knew someone who had suffered a loss. The war dead have already been cremated and their ashes apportioned to 10 Cyprus wood coffins, one for each of the 10 tribes. But there's an 11th coffin which is empty and that's for all those whose bodies could either not be recovered or identified. The 11 coffins have been laid out under a tent for three days so the mourners could pay their respects and now it's time to bury them. The ceremony takes place on the west side of the city, just outside the city wall in the area known as the Keramikos, the foremost cemetery in Athens. Incidentally, the reason why this district was called the Keramikos was because pottery was made here. And the reason why pottery could be made there was because there was a river there, the Eridanos. And the reason why it became the chief pottery manufacturing district in Athens was because pottery was the most popular grave gift. Our word ceramic, which derives from keramos, meaning potter's clay, preserves the memory of this fact. All the dead had to be buried outside the city walls because of the belief that death causes miasma or pollution. Pollution was like an unseen virus that spreads through the community, rendering women infertile, blighting crops, and infecting cattle and humans alike. So picture a day in late September or early October with a vast crowd in attendance, not just citizens, but also women, children, the elderly, and metics. They're there standing reverentially as the coffins are lowered into the ground. And now, as Thucydides describes it, a man chosen by the Deimos, recognized for his eminent wisdom and outstanding reputation, climbs onto a platform to deliver the eulogy on behalf of the war dead. As I said, it's what the Greeks called the epitaphios logos. It was perhaps rather like a commencement address, intended to be both consoling and inspirational. And this year, the man chosen is Pericles. So, we all fall silent and strain to hear what Pericles will say. We've heard a lot of these kinds of speeches over the years. Most of them are pretty forgettable. But if we know anything about Pericles, he's not going to give us a conventional speech in honor of the dead. He's going to turn things upside down in some unexpected, characteristically Periclean way. And in fact, right from the word go, the speech is unlike any other previously delivered on such an occasion. And Pericles begins in the preamble by talking of the difficulty of praising the dead, even though he concedes that he must. So he strikes a note of reluctance from the start, which is out of keeping with the solemnity of the occasion. He's almost saying, I think the tradition of giving a eulogy on behalf of the dead is a pointless exercise, and this is likely to be authentically Periclean because it's in keeping with his reputation for being aloof and Olympian. Then comes the encomium of the ancestors, that's to say, all those who contributed to Athens' greatness. And th this is very perfunctory. Uh, Pericles has little to say about them. He tells us merely that they held on to the land they inherited. Big deal. Then comes the encomion of the previous generation. Uh, this is also fairly traditional. He tells us that they deserve more praise than their ancestors because they actually increased the territory 
the state now owns. What comes next, however, is by no means traditional. Who lie in the coffins before us, Pericles offers us an encomium of Athens, or more accurately, an encomium of the Athenian way of life and of its constitution, its politeia. Pericles' essential claim is that Athens, by its moral qualities, its energy, its enterprise, and its civic virtue, is fitted to a position of cultural and political leadership in the Greek world. Athens is an example, a paradigma, that other cities should admire and emulate. And after this long middle section, we'll look at it in detail in a moment, there follows a short section in which Pericles finally offers a few words in praise of the dead. And this is the least impressive part of the speech. It, it seems almost platitudinous and not at all heartfelt. Pericles ends with the section with this banal piece of sophistry. So they, that's to say the dead, fled from dishonour and put themselves in harm's way, and in one brief moment that was determined by fate, they quitted life at the height not of their fear, but of their fame. And then finally, Pericles turns to address the living. He tells them that they must meditate upon Athens's power daily and become what he calls lovers of Athens. That's the exact word he uses. It's an extraordinary phrase, so that they will be ready to give their lives too. And here, another extraordinary phrase comes up, one that always moves me deeply, because he says, the whole world is the cemetery of famous men, which, of course, is true. Last of all, Pericles addresses severally the various sections of his audience. First, he comforts the parents of the dead, urging those who are still young to have more children. Now, that's a very odd suggestion, as they must be pretty old, and it's also pretty callous, I'd say. And next, he urges those who are past childbearing years to take pride in the fame of their departed sons. And then he has a few words for the sons and brothers of the dead. He tells them that they have a hard task ahead of them, trying to live up to their parents' and brothers' reputation, of which they probably know already. And lastly, notoriously, he offers a few words of advice to the widows of the war dead. He says, Your greatest glory is when you are least talked about, whether for good reasons or for bad. Be socially invisible, in other words. No comment. How accurate is Thucydides' description of Pericles' speech? Is this what he really said? To answer that question, we need to bear in mind what we noted in the previous lecture about what Thucydides writes about the speeches in his history. He claims he kept as closely as possible to what was said while supplying or perhaps injecting what was necessary. So we shouldn't assume that this speech is really any different from any other. It's likely to be a mixture of the actual words in places, larded with a dollop of inventiveness on Thucydides' part. And at the same time, it's very likely that Thucydides heard the speech because it was delivered before he was banished from Athens. And as well, of course, thousands of Athenians and foreigners would have heard it as well, and, and they would certainly have been able to supply details had he requested them. Oh, but we should bear in mind, however, that no Greek or Roman historian held himself, or Greek historians were men, to the same high bar of accuracy as their modern counterparts at least try to do. And that was particularly true of speeches. And there's just one more point to note. When Thucydides introduces Pericles' speech, he does so by writing, he said these sort of things. And that suggests a degree of acknowledged inventiveness on his part. I now want to discuss the question, how accurate and truthful is the picture of Athenian democracy that Pericles paints? That's the middle section. As I said, the Epitaphios Logos is a panegyric, an encomion, a speech in praise, and in this case, 
not of a person, but of a whole society. It paints the picture of a society that is harmonious, open, tolerant, and law-abiding. So it offers a heavily idealized and airbrushed portrait of democratic Athens. The speech also has an agenda. It is contrasting a society that is profoundly free and open and relaxed, that's to say Athens, with its exact opposite, namely Sparta. And Pericles manages to do this without explicitly mentioning the Spartans once. He merely refers to them as our enemies. Certainly some of the claims he makes are true. I'll, I'll concede that. But others are out and out lies. And in addition, there are some claims that are unverifiable and others that are, well, let's just call them inspirational. So we'll start with the truthful claims. Number one, Pericles states, we, he uses the first person plural throughout when he's referring to Athenian democracy, we provide lots of relaxation from toil for the mind through games and, and sacrifices all the year round. Well, no Greek could argue with that. Athens was the cultural capital of the Greek world. And more specifically, the Athenians devoted 144 days per year to the celebration of festivals. That's much more than any other Greek state of which we have knowledge. And that compares with about 115 days off per year, which Americans enjoy, including weekends. And festivals were indeed opportunities for relaxation as, as well as for celebration. Second, we open our city to the world. And that's also true. Athens had the largest population of foreigners living in its midst, by far of any Greek city. Permanent residents, metics in particular. And so far as we know, there was no limit to the number of metics who could live in Athens. Members of its allied cities would also have visited it frequently on a short-term basis. And such was its reputation that non-Greeks probably visited it as well to see the sights, particularly when a, a great state festival was being celebrated, such as the Panathenaea. Third, quote, because of the size of our city, all the produce of all the world enters Athens so that we enjoy the fruits of other lands as much as we enjoy those of our own. Now, that's also largely true as well. The products of all the Greek world entered Athens through its harbor, the Piraeus. Athens was the greatest trading community in the Eastern Mediterranean at this date by far. Next, we alone of all people regard the person who takes no part in politics, not as living a quiet life, but as useless. Well, that's true too. Democracy placed a high burden of participation on all its citizens, as, as we've seen repeatedly in this course. And no doubt there was prejudice against those who refused to participate. That would have been only natural. Next, we have forced every sea and land to become a highway for our daring, and everywhere we have established imperishable monuments of our wicked deeds as well as our good. Well, that's a pretty amazing acknowledgement of the havoc that the Athenian Empire has wreaked in certain quarters. It's honest and it's absolutely true. Athens had certainly made its mark. But Pericles also deals in what we would call today alternative facts. To begin with, consider this one, quote, regarding poverty, no one is prevented from contributing usefully to the state by the lowliness of his social status. Well, that's certainly not true if by it, Pericles means that anyone could get the ear of the speaker in the assembly, for instance. And I'm pretty sure that the poor were mistreated in other ways as well, though since they've not left us any testimony, I can't verify that. In many ways, Athenian society was dominated by its aristocracy, as we've seen, even though Athens eventually became democratic politically. But the statement was true in the sense that anyone whatever their socio-economic status, could, for instance, be a member of the boule. So let's just say there's a little special pleading going on here. 
Second, we alone do good deeds. Pericles means on the world stage. Not through calculation of our own advantage, but freely out of confidence in our liberal values. Confidence in our eleutheria, literally confidence in our freedom. Absolutely and categorically false. What good deeds did the Athenians do to anyone that weren't also self-interested? Orators are constantly making arguments based on advantage and self-interest. Then there are the claims Pericles makes that are unverifiable, such as this one. We don't meddle in our neighbor's affairs by getting upset if he's enjoying himself. Well, perhaps, but who knows? Did Athenians enjoy more privacy than other Greeks? Weren't they busybodies like everybody else, poking their noses in one another's business? There's actually a great Greek noun for meddlesomeness, polypragmosune, and it, it captures perfectly the Athenian fondness, particularly for litigiousness. Next, we obey the law not out of fear, but rather out of respect for those in power and the laws. Possibly true, but again, unverifiable and essentially meaningless. Why does anyone obey the law? How can we possibly know? And lastly, there are the inspirational claims. One of my favorites is this. We love beauty without being extravagant and wisdom without being unmanly. Don't ask me to explain what it means precisely, but what it boils down to is we live within the mean. It reminds me of the words that are inscribed on the retaining wall at Delphi, maiden argan, nothing in excess. Moderation is hardly the watchword of the Athenian Empire or of Athenian democracy or of the Athenian way of life, but it's a wonderful ideal to aspire to. Another inspirational sentence that I love is this. I declare that our whole polis is the school of Greece. I believe that each man brought up in our society demonstrates the most versatility, exhibits the most graceful qualities, and is characterized by the greatest degree of self-sufficiency. I have no quibble with that. This was indeed a society that produced more men of genius per capita than any other in human history. I venture to suggest artists, architects, poets, philosophers, historians, and so forth. And how come? It can't simply have been the water and the scenery and the sunlight. The custom of returning the fallen from the battlefield has not been observed throughout history. We cannot even assume that all Greek city-states prioritized it in the same way the Athenians did. Throughout history, the war dead have, for the most part, been buried in hastily dug pits or trenches on the battlefield, no doubt with the minimum of ceremony. In America, it was the Civil War that changed all that. General Ulysses S. Grant wrote after the Battle of Shiloh, a particularly bloody battle, fought in 1862 in Tennessee. It would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction, stepping only on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground. It was now for the first time that images of the war dead appeared in newspapers and this horrified people. So Abraham Lincoln authorized the creation of national cemeteries to bury the dead. Arlington National Cemetery was established on Robert E. Lee's estate near Washington, D.C. In the two world wars, however, it was impossible to return the bodies of the war dead. There were far too many of them, over 116,000 in World War I and over 292,000 in World War II. So they were buried on the battlefield. But in the Korean War, the war dead were almost all returned home. It, it was the same in the Vietnam War, with the remains of the dead being shipped home within a week or so after death. And currently, it's within a matter of days. There's one very important difference between the way the Athenians honored their war dead 
and the way we honour ours. We commemorate all our war dead on Memorial Day at the end of May. We, we don't limit the commemoration only to those who died in the past 12 months. I suspect we would find it too painful to hold a commemorative ceremony for those who died in a single year, as the Athenians did. And we certainly don't appoint someone recognised for his wisdom and outstanding reputation to deliver a speech in honour of the war dead. Who might that be today, I wonder? In fact, the last time such a speech was delivered was at Gettysburg in November 1863, four months after the Union victory over the Confederates. That was when Edward Everett, the most distinguished orator of his day, delivered a two-hour oration in which he compared the Battle of Gettysburg to the one fought at Marathon. He said, standing beneath this serene sky, overlooking these broad fields, now reposing from the labours of the waning year, the graves of our brethren beneath our feet, it is with hesitation that I raise my poor voice to break the eloquent silence of God and nature. But the duty to which you have called me must be performed. Grant me, I pray you, your indulgence and your sympathy. Oh, there's just a hint of Periclean reluctance in this. But who remembers his speech today? What we remember is Abraham Lincoln's dedicatory remarks, just over two minutes in length, which ended with a resolution that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The American historian Gary Willis has noted a number of parallels between Pericles' speech and Lincoln's, including the commitment to democracy and the urging of survivors to carry on the struggle. And by the way, we also celebrate all those who served in the military on Veterans Day. The Athenians didn't have any equivalent ceremony because, of course, they all served. Pericles' funeral speech is a great read. If you don't read anything else by Thucydides, I strongly recommend you read this. There's no other passage documenting the supposed benefits and virtues of democracy that is more uplifting and inspirational. If Pericles said anything remotely resembling the words that Thucydides puts into his mouth, well, I just wish I had been there to hear him. It would have been very different from the general, run-of-the-mill, patriotic drivel that most orators delivered on this occasion, repeating time and again what Hermann Strasburger characterizes as the constantly similar litany of verbose political self-flattery. I think Pericles' funeral speech would have made the hairs on the back of my neck bristle. It was surely unlike any speech which any other politician gave on this occasion. The only other epitaphios logos which has survived that is authentic was written by an orator called Hyperides, and it was delivered in 323, just at the moment when Athenian democracy was about to be eclipsed. Pericles is, in essence, celebrating or trumpeting Athens and though much of the description is imaginary, you cannot but read the speech and think, what wouldn't I give to live in a society like the one Pericles imagines? I'm reminded of something the great English landscape painter J.M.W. Turner is said to have said when a woman told him she had never seen a sunset like the one he was painting. But don't you wish you had? All this notwithstanding, he, and here I mean primarily Thucydides, but surely Pericles as well, knew that the real Athens was very different from the portrait he painted. Under the pressure of disease, under the pressure of war, uh, the pressure of internal stress, communal values disintegrated. Respect for the law crumbled, and a very different side of man, the political animal, the man who lives in a polis, emerged. And that will be the subject of our next lecture.